Okay, thank you. I uh, welcome members to the <coughs> 35th meeting in 2015 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And as always, ask members to switch off mobile phones, please. Agenda item one is the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill. <coughs> this item of business is for the committee to consider the drafter's response to the committee's questions on the consolidation of parts 9 to 14 of the bill. Do members have any comments, please? Or are we content to note the response? Thank you. Agenda item two, again, the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill, but this item is for the committee to consider whether the consolidation in parts 15 to 18 of the bill, together with the schedules to the bill, correctly restates enactments being consolidated, and also whether the consolidation is clear, coherent, and consistent. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the drafter on the bill in written correspondence. There appears to be a drafting error in section 203A. Drafting in section 203A suggests that the words of which particulars have been registered in the Register of Insolvencies during the year to which the report relates apply only to the winding up and receivership of business associations. Whereas in the original section of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985, the 1985 Act, these same words appear to apply to both the winding up uh, of and receivership of business associations and to the state of all sequestrations. Does the committee agree to draw this to the drafter's attention, please? Agreed. Section 205 sets out the circumstances in which the accountant in bankruptcy, the AIB, must report a matter to the Lord Advocate. Some of the wording from the equivalent section of 1985 Act is not restated or is modified in section 205. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter, one, why the words in performance of his functions under this Act or any other enactment or any rule of law have not been restated in section 25A of the Bill, and two, what the effect of this is considered to be on the meaning of that section, why the word suspect sorry, suspect, in section 1A3 of the 1985 Act, Act has been changed to suppose in section 205 of the bill and for what the effect is uh, considered to be of the meaning of this section. Yes, yes. Thank you. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter, one, why in section 206 one reference to co-obligant is retained in subsection 5 while the other references are restated as obligant, and two, whether there is any reason for this difference in terminology? Yes. Section 223 gives a power to the Scottish Ministers to make regulations in relation to the disqualification provision in any enactment. The equivalent section of 1985 Act, section 71B, provides that a disqualification provision is a provision which disqualifies whether permanently or temporarily and whether absolutely or conditionally a debtor from holding a relevant office. The words whether absolutely or conditionally are not restated in section 2232. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter why the words and whether absolutely or conditionally have, have not been restated in section 223, sorry, 2232 of the bill? Good morning. Under paragraph 5.4 of Schedule 1 to the Bill, a statement of the debtor's current state of affairs must be provided in certain circumstances within six months after the previous statement was given. Under the equivalent provision in the 1985 Act, the statement must be provided on the expiry of those six months. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter, one, why the words on the expiry of the period of six months in paragraph 5.4 of Schedule A1 to the 1985 Act have been changed to within six months in paragraph 5.4 of Schedule 1 of the Bill, and two, what effect this is considered to have on the meaning of the provision. Does the committee agree to draw this to the drafter's attention? Sorry, uh, in paragraph, forgive me, in paragraph 10.3 of Schedule 3, it appears that or in line 4 should instead be of. Does the committee agree to draw this to the drafter's attention? Yes. Thank you. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter why the words or receives payment in respect of an attached article on it, upon its redemption in paragraph 24.3 of Schedule 7 to the 1985 Act and paragraph 24.7 of Schedule 7 to the 1985 Act have not been restated in Schedule 7 of the Bill? It appears that the reference of paragraph 27 of Schedule 8 to the Bill to the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 2013 should be to the Further and Higher Education Scotland Act 2005. Does the committee agree to draw this to the drafter's attention? Yes. Part 2 of Schedule 9 lists the enactments to be revoked by the Bill, including Regulation 45 of the Debt Arrangement Scheme, Scotland Regulations 2011. 
However, Regulation 45 has been revoked by the Debt Arrangement Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014. Does the committee agree to draw this to the draftman's attention? Yes. <coughs> An or has been inserted into the following delegated powers provisions in parts 15 to 18 and the schedules, section 22236 between subsections A and B, section 224. 1 between subsections B and C and Schedule 1 paragraph 27 between subsections A and B. The committee has already explored this issue with the drafter. Does the committee agree to take these further examples into consideration? Yes. Thank you. That concludes Agenda Item 2 and Agenda Item 3 is the succession bill at Stage 2. But in the app Okay, in the absence of the Minister at the moment, I'm proposing we go straight on to Agenda Item 4, and we'll return to Agenda Item 3. Agenda Item 4 is instrument subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, Consequential Modifications and Savings Order 2016 draft, nor on the Continuing Care Scotland Amendment Order 2016 draft. Is the committee content with these, please? Yes, Thank you. The seed, sorry, agenda item five is instrument subject to negative procedure and the Seed Potatoes Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 395. These regulations contain a drafting error. In regulation 18.1, information regarding seed potatoes, the words and of are inserted in error. A breach of the requirements in regulation 18.1 is an offence under section 16.7 of the Plant Varieties and Seeds Act 1964. The Scottish Government has undertaken to amend this provision at the next available opportunity. Does the Committee agree to draw these regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the general regarding ground as they contain a drafting error? Yes. Does the Committee agree that the Scottish Government should lay an amendment as soon as possible? John. Yes, I think uh, it's important that we send a quite a strong message because this is linked to an offence and uh, I would agree with the wording as soon as possible because I think it shouldn't just wait until uh, it suits somebody. Thank you. Thank you. Members are agreed. Thank you. The Management of Offenders etc. Scotland Act 2005, Commencement Number 8 and Consequential Provisions, Order 2015, SSI 2015 at 397. Article 4 makes a consequential amendment of the Management of Offenders etc. Scotland Act 2005, Specification of Persons, Order 2007. This is by virtue of the powers contained within Section 22.2 and 4 of the Management of Offenders etc. Scotland Act 2005, the 2005 Act. <coughs> the consequential amendments must be subject to the affirmative procedure and the provision should be laid in draft as a result of the enabling powers and Section 29 of and Schedule 3.2, the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. The virus of Article 4 is doubtful, given that the affirmative procedure has not been followed. The order also contains a drafting error. Article 3 brings into force Section 10.2b of the 2005 Act, and so far as not already in force, but only for the purposes of Section 10.1e of the 2005 Act. In Article 3, the qualification for the purposes of Section 10.1e is duplicated, confusing the provision. Uh, the Scottish Government has undertaken to lay corrective legislation to come into force on the 31st of March 2016. Does the Committee agree to draw the order to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground E as there is a doubt as to whether Article 4 is in Travere's? Stuart. Um, I, I welcome the fact that the Government is going to take uh, action to ensure um, that uh, the proper order is in place before the, the, the date planned. However, uh, by laying an order uh, which is a negative instrument rather than the affirmative order that we would have expected, um, we, we carry with us the risk that something that is thought and I think agreed with the government to be intravirus by it to be ultra-virus, I beg your pardon, out with the powers that are granted by the primary legislation. We carry the risk that uh, that ends up in the statute book, even though it will never have legal effect. And I would 
uh, urge the government to consider uh, whether it has steps it can take, um, revo revocation or ensuring a, a, a motion not to proceed, that nothing further be done, uh, or other method uh, should be explored to make sure that this instrument does not reach uh, the statute book. Uh, if it, of course, had been an affirmative instrument in the first place, um, that instrument would have only reached the statute book following a resolution of Parliament. By being a negative, uh, it can reach there by, by other means. So I would urge the government to, uh, if possible, uh, take all the action it can to make sure it doesn't reach the statute book. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Convener. I would speak in support of what Stuart Stevenson has just said. In addition, I, I don't think it should read the statute book and thereafter be uh, sorted, so to speak, in as much as it, it, it carries reputational damage for the Parliament. Why did they get there in the first place, um, not, uh, as well as the government? So I think, it's, I think we would urge the government in every possible way to try and amend this and keep it from the statute book. Correct. Yes, I think this appears to be unusual in that uh, we have not had a case before, or at least not very many cases, where it has potentially been ultra-virus, and therefore I, th I do think we need to take a kind of more firm or, or more serious action uh, about this. Um, therefore, I certainly support um, referring it back to the government initially, and then depending on the government's response, uh, perhaps ourselves or some other uh, group within Parliament need to look at it again. Right, we are required to report this week, so we do need to make that decision this week. Uh, I think we do need to encourage the government to find a way of making sure this isn't on the statute book. There are routes open to it and routes open to us, actually, on reflection. Right, on that basis, <coughs> the committee clearly does agree to draw that to the attention of the Parliament. Um, does it also agree to draw the order to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground for the drafting error? The Community Right to Buy Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 400, Regulation 13D2 is defectively drafted. The reference to the 15th of April 2015 should be to the 15th of April 2016. The Scottish Government proposes to lay a correcting instrument before commencement of the regulations on the 15th of April 2016. The meaning of Regulation 20. Two could be clearer in that it does not specify to whom the Scottish Ministers must provide a copy of a community body's modified memorandum, articles of association, constitution or registered rules. The Scottish Government has undertaken to clarify the provision through a further instrument. The meaning of Regulations 1 and 23 could be clearer. Regulations 1 and 23 res relate to, respectively, application and savings. Their effect is that the regulations will apply in respect of community rights to buy, deriving from an application which is made by a community body on or after the 15th of April 2016. Previous legislation regime is saved in respect of applications which are made prior to that date. The regulations do not contain any interpretive provision specifying when an application is made for these purposes. There appears to have been an unusual or unexpected use of the enabling power in Section 52.3 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003. The power enables Scottish ministers to prescribe the form of return to be used by a balloter for the purpose of notifying Scottish ministers and varying other, various other parties of the information specified in Section 52.3a to f. Section 52.3a specifies the result of the ballot as a piece of information which must be so notified by the balloter. However, the form prescribed in Schedule 11 to the regulations does not contain an entry for the balloter to notify the result of the ballot. Does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the following reporting grounds? One, for defective dra dra drafting uh, under reporting ground I. Two, under reporting ground H, as the meaning of regulations 22, 1, 2 and 23 could be clearer. And thirdly, under reporting ground G, as the way the enabling power in Section 52.3 of the 2003 Act has been used appears to be unusual. Yes, Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Sea Potatoes Fees Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 396. Is the committee content with that instrument, please? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item six, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. 
the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, Commencement Number 3, and Savings Order 2015, SSI 2015 The meaning of Article 3 could be clearer. Article 3 provides that the modifications of Parts 2 and 4 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, made by the provisions of the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, commenced by this order, have no effect in relation to a number of specified rights, interests, and powers deriving from a community interest in land where the application to register that interest was made by a community body before the 15th of April 2016. The instrument does not contain any interpretive provision specifying when an application is made. Does the committee agree to draw this instrument to the Parliament's attention under reporting ground H as the meaning of Article 3 could be clearer in that respect? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 7. Um, the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. The purpose of this item is to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bill as amended at stage two. The stage three debate on this bill will take place later today. The committee should therefore agree its conclusions today so these can be captured in a report prior to the debate. Members will have noted the Scottish Government has provided a supplementary delegated powers memorandum and will have seen the briefing paper to the committee. It is proposed that members may wish to find each of the new or substantially amended delegated powers to be acceptable. Members will also note the correspondence from the Scottish Government regarding the proposed stage through amendments which relate to delegated powers. It's suggested that members may also wish to find these amendments to be acceptable insofar as they relate to delegated powers. Does the committee agree to report that it's content with the delegated powers in the bill which have been asserted or substantially amended at stage two? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 10, inquiries into fatal accidents. Uh, sorry? Just give me half a moment. Just give me half a moment. Lands. I think agenda item eight. Yeah. Inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill. Members are invited to consider the delegated powers contained in the bill as amended after stage two. Stage three debate will take place on Thursday the 10th of December. Therefore, members should agree their conclusions today. After stage two, one power to make subordinate legislation has been uh, added. Section 10A3 inserts new subsections 2A to 2C into Section 15 of the Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986, Financial Conditions. Subsection 2B places a duty on Scottish ministers to make regulations providing for the alternative financial conditions which will apply where certain family members make an application for civil legal aid in respect of a fatal accident inquiry. Regulations affecting financial conditions in the 1986 Act are usually subject to the affirmative rather than the negative procedure. Does the committee agree to report that, one, it is content in principle with the power in section 10A3, and two, it recommends the bill be amended at stage three to make the power subject to affirmative procedure? Agenda <coughs> item nine, smoking prohibition. Children in Motor Vehicles Scotland Bill. The purpose of this item is to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bills amended at stage two. The stage three debate for this bill will take place on Thursday the 17th of December. Therefore, members should again agree their conclusions today. It is proposed that members may wish to find all the new and amended powers acceptable. Uh, does the committee agree to report that it is content with the delegated powers in the bill which have been amended or removed at stage two? Yes. Thank you. At which point, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Wheelhouse, the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, who has come, I suspect, hot foot from elsewhere in the building. Um, I'm delighted to say, Minister, that we've managed to get through the rest of the programme, so we're now coming back to Agenda Item 3, I think, which is the Succession Scotland Bill. Um, just need to make sure that everybody's comfortable and also that I have actually got the right papers in front of me. Um, okay, so we turn now to the formal stage two proceedings 
uh, on the Succession Scotland Bill, and I welcome the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, who is accompanied by Jill Clark, the Head of Civil Law Reform Unit, Rosalind Wood, who is Solicitor, and Amanda McFarlane, Scot Parliamentary Counsel from the Scottish Government. For the purposes of Stage 2, members should have copies of the Bill, as well as the marshalled list and groupings. Um, At this point, um, we're dealing with Section 1, and I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendments 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. Minister, if you'd like to move Amendment 1, please, and speak to other members in the group. Thank you, Convener, and uh, apologies for, for the delay. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here and get, get away from the Justice Committee for, for a while. Um, the, these amendments do a number of things, Convener. Um, firstly, Amendments 1, 5 and 6 amend Section 1 to ensure that a provision in a will appointing a person's spouse or civil partner as guardian continues to take effect, even if the marriage or civil partnership is terminated. We are grateful to the Law Society of Scotland for highlighting the potential for an anomalous situation under the Bill in respect of the appointment of guardians. Uh, as we set out in a letter to the Committee following the Stage 1 evidence sessions, we acknowledge the concerns raised in evidence that as the appointment of a guardian can be made not only in a will but in separate documentation, there may be a risk of treating guardians differently according to the documentation that has appointed them. For that reason, we concluded that it is not appropriate to apply uh, different outcomes to guardianship provisions made in a will as opposed to any other documentation. The second set of amendments, 4 and 9, change the term fail to survive in sections 1 and 2 of the bill to ensure that it is clear what is meant is that the person died before the testator. As the committee are aware through their scrutiny of the bill, the timing of death is critical in succession law as someone must survive to inherit and equally sometimes for another person to inherit it must be clear that the person on whom their inheritance is conditional has died before the testator. The same may be applicable to other testament, uh, testament, testamentary uh, wishes such as appointments. Failure to survive does not necessarily mean that a person can be regarded as dying before another person. A person who fails to survive the testator may have died at the same time as them. And in some cases, to achieve the policy objectives in the bill, it is important that it is clear that a person died before another person. So, for example, in Section 1, if the testator appointed their ex-spouse or ex-civil partner as executor and also made provision that their sibling should be the executor if their spouse or civil partner predeceases them, it's arguably not clear from that, the section as it stands that the sibling could be appointed because it's not clear that the ex-spouse or ex-civil partner would be treated as having predeceased. Uh, Amendment 4 therefore amends Section 1 to ensure that a former spouse or civil partner is to be regarded as dying before the testator for the purposes of the will. Amendment 9 amends Section 2 to make it clear that a former spouse or civil partner is to be regarded as dying before the other spouse or civil partner where there is a special destination of property in favour of a spouse or civil partner and the marriage or civil partnership is terminated. There are other references in the Bill to, to failure to survive and we propose similar amendments to some of those other references and we will come on to discuss those amendments later. Amendments 2 and 8 are small but nevertheless important uh, amendments which are intended to place beyond doubt that death must occur after the termination of a marriage or civil partnership in order for the presumptions introduced by sections 1 and 2 to apply. Section 1 of the bill provides that wills made in favour of a former spouse or civil partner are effectively revoked by the legal end to the relationship. Section 2 makes equivalent provision for the revocation of special destinations. It is not the policy intention that the presumption of revocation introduced by sections 1 and 2 of the bill should apply where a marriage or civil partnership is annulled after the death of the testator. A presumption that the testator intended to sever ties with the former spouse can only be drawn if the testator was aware of the legal separation. Whilst the circumstances in which this could occur are both narrow and unlikely, we nevertheless see merit in amending these sections to put it beyond doubt that the they only apply where the legal termination takes place before the testator dies. This ensures there is no possibility of the arrangements under a will or special destination being picked apart years after the testator's death. In their written evidence, the Law Society of Scotland suggested that Section 1 should apply where the testator either died domiciled in Scotland or has heritable property in Scotland. In effect, they wanted Section 1 to apply where Scots law of succession currently applies under private international law. At present, Section 1 only applies where the testator is domiciled in Scotland. 
and we agree with this view. Under Scots rules of international uh, private law, succession to immovable uh, estate is governed by lex situs, the, the uh, location where the property is situated. In the contrast, um, succession to movable property is governed by the domicile of the deceased at death. Scots law of succession will therefore apply where testator dies domiciled out with Scotland but owns heritable property in Scotland. But as I have said, section 1 does not presently cover this. To remedy the position, Amendment 3 removes the condition at section 1, subsection 1D, which requires the testator to be domiciled in Scotland. This means that section 1 will apply in accordance with the normal rules of private international law. It will therefore now apply where the testator had heritable property in Scotland, but died domiciled out with Scotland. The Law Society of Scotland is content with this approach, convener. And finally, in this group, Amendment 7 is a minor amendment which addresses the suggestion made by the Law Society of Scotland in the written evidence to the committee that, as it stood, this section may not apply in the situation where property such as business premises is held in the name of a couple and a number of other people so that uh, a special destination in favour of a former spouse or civil partner would not be revoked in these circumstances. Generally, we would rely on the provisions of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010 to extend the singular to the plural. We noted, however, that in Section 2, we expressly refer to survivor or survivors and do not rely on the 2010 Act. So this amendment is uh, intended to provide for both consistency and clarity in terminology. Uh, I move Amendment 1, Camille. Thank you very much. Do members have any comments to, to make? Thank you very much. I take it, therefore, Minister, there will be nothing that you will want to add. Indeed, so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call Amendments 2 to 6, all in the name of the Minister and previously debated. Invite the Minister to move Amendments 2 to 6 on block. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you very much. Does the members have any objection? Uh, can I ask for the generality whether members are expecting to have any objection in the future? To moving them on block. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Therefore, the single question um, whether amendments two to six are agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. The question now is whether section one is agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. And I call amendments seven, eight, and nine, all in the name of the minister and all previously debated, and invite the minister to move amendments seven to nine on block. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you, on the basis that members do not object to a single question. Are members happy to agree those amendments? Yes. Thank you very much. At which point the question is whether section two is agreed. Are we agreed, please? Thank you. Section 3, the rectification of wills and execution of documents. And I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 11, 12, 13, 35, 36 and 37. And ask the Minister to move Amendment 10 and speak to all others in the section, please, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the draft Scottish Law Commission Bill contained a provision at Section 27, subsection 10c, which enabled a sheriff in the sheriffdom where confirmation of the will was obtained uh, to, to have jurisdiction to consider an application for rectification of a will or take action to give effect to the will as rectified. The other grounds for jurisdiction in the bill are based on the habitual residence of the testator. Uh, an int introduction on a, uh, at introduction, an equivalent provision was inadvertently not included in the bill. Uh, shrieval jurisdiction for confirmation hinges on the domicile of the testator, which may in a small number of cases be different from the testator's habitual residence. We therefore consider that the bill should be amended in line with the Scottish Law Commission uh, bill to ensure that the sheriffdom in which confirmation is obtained always has jurisdiction as it is foreseeable that beneficiaries may be located where confirmation uh, is obtained. This amendment remedies the oversight and reflects that our policy intention was always to mirror the provisions of the SLC bill in this respect. The amendments to section 14 are simply to alter the corresponding provisions uh, there so that the drafting structure of the two similar provisions are more aligned. Uh, I move amendment 10. Thank you very much, Minister. Do members have any comments to make? Uh, the question is that amendment 10... I do need to check, forgive me, Minister, that you don't wish to add anything. Uh, could, I, could I again 
in the generality ask whether you are ever expecting to want to add if the members have not made any comments. I, I would be happy to, to leave it, uh, no, Commissioner. Thank, thank you, Minister. I think I'm just trying to speed up the process. Forgive me. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. I now call amendments 11, 12 and 13 in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 11, 12 and 13, please. On Formally moves, Convener. Uh, and ask members whether they agree. The question is that amendments 10, 11 to 13 are agreed. Are we all yes, agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the question, therefore, is whether section 3 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is whether sections 4 and 5 be agreed. Agreed? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Text us to section 6, where the death before the legacy vests. And I call amendment 14 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendments 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Thank you, Convener. Uh, there presently exists a, a common law uh, rule that if a legatee within a certain class dies after the date of the will, but before the date of vesting, his or her issue take the legacy unless the will provides otherwise. Section 6 of the bill places this common law rule on a statutory footing with some modification. One modification the Scottish Law Commission recommended was that the class of legatees should be confined to direct descendants of the testator. In the course of discussions with the Scottish Law Commission, we came to the conclusion that as presently drafted, Section C may not give effect to that intention because while Section 6 clearly applies where there is a legacy to several people, there is nothing to say that all those people require to be direct descendants of the testator. These uh, amendments are intended to place beyond doubt that Section 6 should apply only where the legacy is left to one or more direct descendants. It should not apply where legacy was given to several people, some of whom were not direct descendants. During the evidence sessions on the bill, Professor Roddy Paisley raised another issue about this section. He suggested that the section should be amended to change the reference from names to identifies. This was because, in his view, the provision may not apply if a testator failed to actually name a beneficiary and instead identified them by class, for example, my son or my brother, etc. We know that in the Stage 1 report, the committee recommended that this suggestion be taken on board. The amendment also deals with this point. Uh, as there is no longer a reference to names and the provision will clearly apply where a testator identifies a beneficiary, however that is done, for example, by class or category or by name. Uh, and I move Amendment 14, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, do members have any comments to make? Uh, the question is, therefore, that Amendment 14 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I call amendments 15 to 25, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move these amendments 15 to 25 on block. Or may move, Convener. Uh, the question then is whether amendments 15 to 25 are agreed. Are we agreed, please? Yes. Thank you. The question is whether section 6 be agreed. Yes. Thank you. The question is whether sections 7 and 8 be agreed. Yes. Thank you. Section 9, survivorship. I call Amendment 26 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendments 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 and 32. I ask the Minister to move Amendment 26 and speak to all others in the group, please. Thank you, Convener. Section 9 is another section where the term fail to survive is used. Uh, this section deals specifically with what should happen in a common calamity. Amendment 26 ensures that where a benefit is conferred on a third party on the condition that another person predeceases the testator and that person dies in a common calamity with the testator, they will be treated as having died before the testator to enable the legacy to pass to the third party. By ensuring that a legacy can pass to a secondary beneficiary where the testator and the primary beneficiary have died in a common calamity, it is also less likely that in these circumstances the estate will become intestate. Um, additionally, in evidence, a number of witnesses have said that the interaction between sections 9 and 10, which deal with survivorship, are not clear. The committee had some sympathy with these concerns and recommended in the Stage 1 report that section 10, subsection 4, should be amended so that in some circumstances both sections may apply and that this would avoid an estate falling into intestacy. I appreciate the committee's concerns. The rules to deal with survivorship are by their nature quite complex, given the need to take account of a range of different situations and avoid unintended effects. Before turning to the amendments that I propose are made to Section 10, it may assist if I set out for the committee what we are trying to achieve through Sections 9 and 10. Section 9 is a modified restatement of the existing general survivorship rule, which states that where two people die at the same time, for all purposes of succession, they will each be treated as failing to survive the other. 
In effect, they are written out of each other's estates. For the purposes of succession, the policy intention is that estates should go to the surviving family or beneficiaries. In contrast, Section 10 deals with a narrow and particularly a particular set of circumstances for which the existing law does not provide a satisfactory solution. These circumstances cover where property is to pass to one member of a, of a group of people depending on the order of death and members of the group are involved in a common calamity. All members of the group are potential beneficiaries and have equal status in the sense that the testator's intention is that any one of them could benefit from the legacy. In these circumstances, the new rule provides that the property will be divided equally among their estates. Section 10 does not apply if the property is to pass under a will and the testator is part of the common calamity. This is because the general rule is that a beneficiary should survive the testator in order to benefit from a right of succession under a will. Where the testator is part of the common calamity, then the rule in section 9 should apply. It would not be appropriate for other people who have died in the calamity to benefit from the testator's estate. This ensures that any legacies will vest in the estates of living family members or legatees rather than in the estates of deceased beneficiaries who have not survived the testator. We therefore do not think it's appropriate to amend section 10, subsection 4, so that the rule in section 10 applies when the testator is part of the common calam calamity. We do accept that there is merit in clarifying the circumstances in which Section 10 is to apply. Amendment 30 therefore sets out in full the various scenarios when property may transfer to one member of a group depending on the order of death. In doing so, we hope that this uh, sets out more clearly the different scenarios that are intended to be covered by the Law Commission's report as set out at paragraph 660. I also propose some uh, other minor amendments to Section 10 to make it clear that the rule applies whatever the means by which property is to pass to members of a group. This is to address a separate concern that has been raised that the reference to property passing under a will or obligation might not cover property that passes under trust provisions. Separately, whilst I do not accept that Sections 9 and 10 will necessarily result in more intestacies, the amendment proposed to Section 9 that will have the effect of avoiding one of the intestacy scenarios that has been raised. We are therefore confident that we are addressing the concerns that the interaction between the sections is unclear and may result in more estates falling into intestacy. I, I move Amendment 26, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Do members have any comments? Thank you. The question is therefore that Amendment 26 be agreed. Are we agreed, please? Yes. The question is that Section 9 be agreed. Yes. Thank you. I now call amendments 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 and 32, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 27 to 32 on block. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. And the question is that amendments 27 to 32 are agreed. Yes. Thank you very much. The question is that section 10 be agreed. Yes. The question is that section 11 be agreed. Are we yes. agreed? Thank you. Section 12 on forfeiture, and I call Amendment 33 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment 34. I ask the Minister to move 33 and the other movement. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the for forfeiture rule is a rule of public policy which, in certain circumstances, precludes a person who has unlawfully killed another from acquiring a benefit in consequence of that killing. Section 12 provides that in circumstances where a person has forfeited their rights to the estate of the deceased, their beneficial interest in trust property or their title to property by virtue of a special destination, they are to be treated as having failed to survive the deceased so that the estate can pass to other beneficiaries where appropriate. I have already outlined the reasons that the term fail to survive does not necessarily mean that a person can be regarded as dying before another person. And for that reason, Amendment 33 amends Section 12 to make it clear that where a person forfeits rights of succession in the estate of the deceased under the forfeiture rule, they are regarded as having died before the victim. In terms of what is forfeited, Section 12, uh, subsection 1A, refers to the rights of succession to the estate of the deceased. In the written evidence of Section 12, the Trusts and Succession Law Subcommittee of the Law Society of Scotland said they agreed with the provision, but, and I quote, would point out that legal rights are not technically a right of succession as classically defined, unquote. They suggested that the provision be amended to expressly include legal rights within the definition for the purposes of the section. We accept that there may, have, uh, there may be an issue here. Section 36, subsection 1 of the 1964 Act refers to the net estate as meaning the estate that remains after dealing with the debts that have priority over legal rights, the prior rights and, uh, quote, rights of succession, the latter being undefined, unquote. That definition suggests a distinction is to be made between legal rights prior rights 
and, I quote, rights of succession uh, under the current law. The intention is that the forfeiture rule applies to any right that a person has to succeed to the estate of an individual unlawfully killed. The amendment will therefore put beyond doubt that the rights which are forfeited include legal and prior rights. The Latin terms in the first limb of the amendment are more commonly known as legal rights. Uh, I move amendment 33. Thank you, Minister. Do members have any comments, questions? Thank you. The question is therefore that amendment 33 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 34. In the name of the Minister, just debated with Amendment 33. Minister, to move, please. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 12 be agreed. Yes. And Section 13 be agreed. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> section 14, and I call Amendments 35, 36 and 37, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I invite the Minister to move Amendments 35 to 37 on block. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. So the question is that Amendments 35 to 37 are agreed. Are yes. we agreed, please? The question is that Section 14 be agreed. Yes. Thank you. The question is that que Sections 15 to 19 be agreed. Are we agreed, please? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Gifts made in contemplation of death, and I call Amendment 38 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment 39. Minister, to move Amendment 38 and speak to both, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, a donation mortis causa is a gift with the following uh, characteristics. It is made by the donor in anticipation of their death. It is made on the understanding that when the donor dies, the recipient keeps the gift, but that if the donor survives, it should be returned to them. Uh, the donor can change their mind at any point and ask for the gift to be returned and... If the recipient dies first, then the gift is returned to the donor. This special form of gift is counted as part of the donor's estate for the purposes of any claim uh, for legal rights in the event of intestacy. It is also liable for the donor's debts uh, on death in the event that the rest of the donor's estate is insufficient to meet them. Section 20 abolishes this special form of gift as a distinct legal entity. It does not prevent people from continuing to make gifts on such express conditions as they wish to impose and which the recipient is prepared to accept. In evidence, the view was expressed that the words, uh, and I quote, in contemplation of death, unquote, in section 20, subsection 2, do not appear to be necessary. The Scottish Government explained to the committee that the wording aimed to make clear that while uh, donation mortis causa as a distinct legal entity is abolished, a gift may still be transferred to a donee on the same terms that a donation mortis causa was. The, the Scottish Government undertook to reflect further on the drafting of section 20 and has brought forward these amendments to address the point. And the amendments do not change the effect of Section 20. I move Amendment 38. Thank you. Minister, do members have any comments? Thank you. The question then is that Amendment 38 be agreed to. Are we agreed, please? Yes, yes. Thank you. I now call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister and already debated. Minister to move 39. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Section 20 be agreed to. Yes. Are we agreed? The question is that sections 21 to 24 be agreed. Are we agreed, yes, please? Yes. The question is that schedule that the schedule be agreed to. Yes. Are agreed? Thank you. The question is that sections 25 to 27 be agreed. Yes. Are we agreed, please? The question is that long title be agreed to. Yes. Are we agreed? And that completes stage two consideration of the bill. Thank you. And I think that completes the agenda. And I now close this meeting. Thank you, colleagues.